నమస్కారం డాక్టర్ బిఆర్ అంబేద్కర్ సార్వత్రిక విశ్వవిద్యాలయం విద్యార్థులకు స్వాగతం ఈరోజు డాక్టర్ బిఆర్ అంబేద్కర్ ఓపెన్ యూనివర్సిటీ విద్యార్థులకి తర్వాత ఈ కార్యక్రమాన్ని చూస్తున్న వాళ్ళందరూ కూడా ఒక రకంగా అదృష్టవంతులని మనం చెప్పుకోవాలి ఎందుకంటే మన మధ్యన ఉన్నటువంటి ఈ వ్యక్తి ఒక సామాన్యమైనటువంటి వ్యక్తి కాదు ఇతని జీవితకాలం అంతా అసాధారణంగా సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికాలో మానవ హక్కుల కొరకని సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికా స్వాతంత్రం స్వేచ్ఛ కొరకని జీవితకాలం అంతా పోరాటం చేశారు ఆయన నెల్సన్ మండేలాతో ముఖ్యంగా ఆఫ్రికన్ నేషనల్ కాంగ్రెస్తో అండర్గ్రౌండ్ యాక్టివిటీలో కూడా పాల్గొన్న వ్యక్తి ఆయన సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికా ప్రజల యొక్క హక్కులని అంతర్జాతీయంగా ముఖ్యంగా యునైటెడ్ నేషన్స్ ముందు ఆయన వెళ్ళి వాళ్ళని డిఫెండ్ చేశారు తర్వాత సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికా భా రాజ్యాంగాన్ని రాసేప్పుడు ఎలాగైతే డాక్టర్ అంబేద్కర్ మన భారత రాజ్యాంగాన్ని రాయడంలో పాల్గొన్నారో అదేవిధంగా జస్టిస్ యాకూబ్ గారు ముఖ్యంగా వాళ్ళ ఫండమెంటల్ రైట్స్ చాప్టర్ ఏదైతే ఉందో దాన్ని రాయడంలో ముఖ్యంగా ఆ చాప్టరును షేప్ చేయడంలో ఆయన చాలా ప్రధానమైనటువంటి పాత్ర వహించారు తర్వాత ఈ మానవ హక్కుల చైతన్యం వలన ఈరోజు ఆయన ఈ పాఠం చెప్పడం అనేది చాలా సబబుగా ఉంది అంతేకాకుండా మనిషిగా జా యాకూబ్ గారు ఒక మానవీయమైన ప్రజాస్వామ్యమైనటువంటి మనిషి ఆయన ఈనాటి కూడా ప్రపంచమంతా ఒక ఆనందమైన సంతోషకరమైన ప్రపంచంగా మారాలని ఆయనకు ముఖ్యంగా ఈ జడ్జిగా తాను సెబాటికల్ లీవ్లో ఆయన అమెరికాకు యూరోప్కు వెళ్ళగలిగిన అవకాశం ఉన్నా ఆయన భారతదేశంలో ఆరు నెలలు ఉండాలని భారత ప్రజలకి సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికా ప్రజల మధ్యన సత్సంబంధాలు ఉండాలని ఈ రెండు దేశాల మధ్యన ఉండే ప్రజలు స్వేచ్ఛా స్వాతంత్రంలో బ్రతకాలనేటువంటి ఒక ఆకాంక్ష ఆయనకు చాలా తీవ్రంగా ఉంది దాంట్లో భాగంగానే ఆయన మన హైదరాబాద్లో కొంతకాలం గడుపుతున్నారు దాంట్లో భాగంగా జస్టిస్ యాకూబ్ గారు మన మధ్యన ఉన్నారు ఆయన ఈరోజు సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికాలో మానవ హక్కుల గురించి మాట్లాడతారు మానవ హక్కులు ఎలా ఉన్నాయి వాటి బ్యాక్గ్రౌండ్ ఏమిటి తర్వాత ఈరోజు రాజ్యాంగంలో వాటి స్థానం ఏమిటి సౌత్ ఆఫ్రికాలో మానవ హక్కుల పరిస్థితి ఏంటో దాన్ని వివరించవలసిందిగా జస్టిస్ యాకూబ్ గారిని మీ తరఫున యూనివర్సిటీ తరఫున నేను కోరుకుంటున్నాను నా ఐ రిక్వెస్ట్ జస్టిస్ యాకూబ్ to address uh, the students uh, of the open university and also the general public who are watching this program on the state of human rights in south africa uh thank you very much professor hargopal for those words of introduction i must uh, start by saying that it is an honor to address uh, students of uh, the open university and uh, uh, many people who are not students who are uh the people of india and who have shown such an interest in human rights in south africa now human rights in south africa are incorporated in chapter 2 of the south african constitution our constitution is a new constitution compared to india's constitution which was adopted more than 50 years ago ours was adopted in 1996 um it is uh, only 5 years old now compared to your constitution and therefore such differences as there are between the two constitutions are the result of that time difference our constitution like your constitution was adopted uh, as part of a negotiating process entered into by the majority of the people of South Africa with the representatives of the minority who had oppressed the majority of African people for many many years in your country the problem was not between the minority and majority of people but rather the problem of the oppression of indian people by people from britain 
So although there were differences, there were similarities as well. In my view, the most important similarity between your constitution and ours is that it was accepted by both negotiations that the constitution in itself does not succeed in achieving human rights in any country. The constitution and the law can never achieve equality, can never achieve human dignity. And therefore the most that a constitution can do, the most that a bill of rights can do, is to create a facilitative framework, a foundation, a springboard, within which and from which the people of our respective countries have an opportunity to develop a human rights culture. That culture, and I must talk to you about that briefly before we go into the constitutional mechanism for that culture, that culture is a culture of human caring, a culture in which people recognize each other as worthy of respect as human beings, of having the dignity of human beings and of caring for each other. And unless we begin to inculcate this culture of caring, this culture of respect, this culture of recognizing the dignity of each human being, a thousand constitutions, a thousand laws, a million provisions will make no difference at all. The second general point I want to make is to criticize a tendency which exists among many people that it is the duty of the government to achieve human rights and that it is the people who are the beneficiaries. So when each of us think of rights, we think of our rights. We think of our dignity, we think of our freedom and our security, we think of our right to be equal, but we think of other people, like the government, like big business, like university authorities, who have the obligations. I want to say that uh, this tendency, uh, this approach, where we begin to think that we are the bearers of rights and others are the bearers of obligations, does not begin to contribute towards a human rights culture. What we should understand is that a human rights culture begins to develop only if we have obligations. Only if each of us begin to think about what we can do towards the establishment of a human rights culture, and only if we, began, we begin to do things towards establishing that human culture. And the logic is simple. The logic is that if each and every one of us does things towards ensuring a human rights culture and towards ensuring respect for and the human rights of others, our human rights will be automatically fulfilled. Against that background, we must look very briefly at chapter 2 of, of our constitution, the Constitution of South Africa, which encapsulates the fundamental rights in our constitution. In South Africa, I must start by saying that the Bill of Rights 
is binding upon the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. And therefore it is important to note that human rights are uh, binding on the judges too. We know already about the debate, the human rights debate concerning first generation rights, second generation rights and third generation rights. First generation rights which are civil and political rights were the first category of rights to be placed on to the human rights agenda. And these would include the right to dignity, the right to vote, the right to freedom and security of the person, the right to freedom of speech, and the right to freedom of assembly. There are others too, but these rights are the kind of rights which are generally referred to as first generation rights. Later in the human rights discourse, they began the thinking that first generation rights by themselves are not enough and the so-called second generation rights were introduced into the debate. These rights are generally referred to as socio-economic rights. They would be the right to housing, the right to social welfare, the right to health care, the right to education and such matters. And even later in the discourse, there was introduced into the human rights agenda rights which were referred to as third generation rights, which were referred to as environmental rights. At the initial stages of the debate and after all three generations of rights had been introduced onto the human rights agenda, the thinking was that only first generation rights were justiciable in the sense of being enforceable by the courts. And the thinking by necessary implication was that second and third generation rights, that is socio-economic rights and environmental rights, were not enforceable by the courts. They were not enforceable because so the argument ran, uh, they consisted really of rights which were enforceable only as a result of government policy decisions which involved considerable governmental expenditure. And it was at, as a result of this thinking during the 1940s that the Indian constitution does not contain socio-economic rights as part of the enforceable rights. It has a Bill of Rights which contains civil and political rights within it, but is not totally silent in relation to socio-economic rights. The socio-economic rights in the Indian Constitution are contained in a part of the Constitution which deals with the directives and principles of state policy on the basis that these socio-economic rights, these principles and directives need to be taken into account by the state. The Indian Supreme Court has been quite imaginative and creative and in a large number of cases, and under the determination of the right to life in the South African, in, sorry, the, in the determination of the right to life in the Indian constitution, has held 
that socio-economic rights too are important and has to some extent held that the fact that these rights are contained as directives of and principles of state policy means that the government is to an extent bound by them. As I said earlier, the South African constitution was prepared 50 years later as a result of negotiations which went on during the period 1991 until 1998, but negotiations, sorry, until 1996, but negotiations which were indeed finalized in 1996. Our constitution contains all three generations of rights. First generation rights have been incorporated by ensuring that the rights are drafted in an open-ended way, in a generous way, and in an unqualified way, generally speaking. Uh, for example, Section 10 of the South African Constitution says in simple, unqualified terms, everyone has the right to life. This does not mean that everyone has a right to lead a good life in South Africa, whatever the circumstances and whatever the impact of the exercise of one person's right to life may be on other people's rights or on the economy of the country. That is the reason why Section 36 of our Constitution provides for the limitation of rights, so that all rights of uh, a civil and political kind, like the right to life, are stated in an unqualified way, but the state has the right to limit them. That right to limit is a conditional one. The state can only limit the right by a law of general application, not by administrative action, but by a law of general application. But that right must be justifiable in an open and a democratic society based on dignity, equality and freedom. Socio-economic rights, on the other hand, are incorporated in a different way. And we must take the right to housing as an example. The right to housing says in section 26, one of our constitution, that everyone has the right of access to adequate housing. But the definition of the right to life does not stop there. It goes further, and unlike the right to life, in the case of the right to housing, the state obligations are carefully defined. So that in subsection 2 of section 26, the Constitution says that the state is obliged to take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to ensure the progressive realization of this right. That means that the state obligations are not unqualified or undetermined, nor are they affected simply by the provisions of Section 20, uh, 36 of the Constitution. The state obligation in relation to socio-economic rights are carefully defined. The state is not uh, obliged to take reasonable legislative measures only. It must take reasonable legislative and other measures. These measures must be within available resources and they must ensure the progressive realization of the right. Before I tell you briefly how the Constitutional Court has interpreted these provisions, I must tell you why they were drafted in this way. 
They were drafted in this way because in the negotiating process, the minority representatives, those who represented the white minority, said that it was inappropriate to include the right to uh, socio-economic matters in our constitution because these were not justiciable, they were not enforceable, they were matters of government policy. Majority representatives, on the other hand, wanted the right incorporated in some way so that a balance was struck between the two provisions. On the one hand, it was understood that some provision had to be made for socio-economic rights in our constitution and that the government could not be left to decide on its own what it could and could not do in relation to socio-economic rights. On the other hand, it was clearly understood that no socio-economic rights in, in our constitution, and I would suggest that that applies to the Indian constitution too, could be conferred in such a way as to create the impression that everybody would have houses or that everybody would have perfect health facilities in our constitution immediately. That it would take time to ensure that socio-economic rights were properly conferred. And it was the need to create this balance, a balance aimed at ensuring that, that the government will be obliged to, to do something, but a balance which did not mean that everybody would be entitled to everything immediately, which gave rise to the way in which uh, this socio-economic right in our constitution was drafted. So you will see that the obligations are carefully stated. The Constitutional Court has interpreted this right to mean that in order to comply with the requirement to take reasonable legislative and other measures, the government is required to have in relation to housing a coherent, well-coordinated program a program which is implementable and a program which involves both, uh, which involves rather all three levels of government, national government, provincial government and local government. It must be a program which must be reasonable in the sense that it does embrace the needs of the most vulnerable in our society, the needs of the weak in our society and the needs of people in crisis. The Constitutional Court has said that what within reasonable, uh, within its available resources means is that a reasonable portion of the budget, of the total budget, must be allocated towards the achievement of this particular right to housing. And then at the second level, a reasonable portion of the amount allocated to housing must be allocated to dealing with crises, to ensuring the provision of housing for vulnerable people. And finally, it has said that the progressive realization of the right means that the right to housing must be available to more and more people and to a wider range of people as time progresses. So we have given in our constitution practical effect to the notion that there is an interrelationship between socio-economic rights on the one hand and civil and political rights on the other. The court has given a judgment which has made it quite clear that the government has to do something about ensuring that a reasonable portion of the budget is devoted to socio-economic rights. By incorporating these rights, 
we have created a facilitative framework, a framework within which the people can do as much as possible to ensure that all rights are met, a framework within which the government can do as much as is possible to ensure that socio-economic rights are met, and only the future will tell whether the provisions we've made in our constitution will work. Thank you very much indeed. Justice Yaakub Garu, Tama Prasangan Lo, Bharata Rajanganiki, Dakshin Africa Rajangani Kunde twenty, Taratam Yamu, Dan Kunde twenty, Okarakman at twenty, Sadharnaman at twenty, Lakshnalani, Marku Vincher. Aute Tama Prasangan Lo, Bharata Rajangam Rai Bada Kalaniki, Dakshin Africa Lo Rajangam Rai Bada Kalaniki, Theda Undamalna, Samakali in a Samajan Lo Unde twenty, Sadharna Paristitulu. Rajanga Nila Prabhan Chestayo and Emshani Kuda, Ayanatana Prasangalo, Vivincher. Aute Bharata Rajangan Lo, Prathamika Hakulu, Watu Batu, Samajika Arthika Paramena Hakula, Prasavan Undi. Dakshin Africa Rajangan Lo Kuda, Adevithanga, Prathamika Hakulu, Ante Paura, Rajiki Hakulu, Samajika Arthika Hakulu, Unai. Can a part of Rajangalo, Prathamic Hakul Matrame, Naya Paramanavani, Naya Samatamanavani, and a Naya Layalu Dantlo, Jokin Chescoatsani, Samajika Arthika Paramana Hakulu, Rajamo, Tanakunde Vandalan Bati, Dirka Kalanlo, Sathin Savas and Hakulani, Avi Naya Badhanga, Avi Court Lequeli, Manamo, Adaga Valsana Leda, Adaga Elegan at twenty Hakuluga, Angi Kanisabalid. Kani, Dakshin Africa Rajangalo, Samajika Arthika Hakulan Kuda, Rajanga Badhamena Hakuluga, Walu Chersananika Pradhana Karanamu, Dakshin Africa Rajangu, Pandhanla Tombaharlo Rived in Malna, Prapancha Vaptanga, Uchina Marpula, Ku Pratipalnaga, Marpula Ku, Parevasananga, Rajangalo Konta Teda, Unadi, Anit twenty Amshani, Prastavin Charu, Rajangal Raskotsu, Rajangalo Hakulu Raskotsgani. Raskunanta Matrana Avi Amalota and Kani, Aven Achan Locosta and Chapamus Achen Kadu. If you put Amal Locostai and te Ye Rajamete, Adhika, Ye Rajiki apart Latika Lunayo, Wald Vitike Katubadi, Chitta Shudito, what Namal Chedamo, Prajalu, Y Hakulagun Chapatins Kondamo, Samajan Lone Day twenty, Leda Power Samajan Lone Day, Prajalandar Kuda, Hakulani Arthanches Kuntune, Tamabadhe Temito Telisi, Andru Danito Sahakarin Chenapre, Rajangalu. Archan low, Palavantamata and at twenty Amshanigura or Cheperu. Aute, Eros, Dakshin Africa, Lotama Rajangamu, low Ponduparchan Hakulu. Archan look a laos tie, and then Raboe Kalame, Daniki, Telutia, Raboe Kalno, Telustundani, Kalame than in Rene Sundani. Andaru, Sukanga Jivinche, Prapanchamu, Andaru Gauranga Jivinche, twenty Samaj and Kavalani. Dani Kavals in a twenty Rajiki a paramena, Rajanga paramena twenty, Woka framework, than Kavals in a twenty, Woka Samsidha Tundikani, than Archan Lokoche twenty Kramumu, Rabaya Kamlo Telstundi and Tamshani, or Chaptu, Tamaprasangani, Mobinchar. E. Karakramumpai, me Abiprayalni, Suchalni, Salahalni, Avhanistanam, Machirnama, the director, audio visual production and research center. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University, Prof. G. Ramredi Marg, Road No. 46, Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad, 500033.